Welcome back to the Always Reading Book Club. It is your girl Kiki Reader and we are starting a new series. I have been wanting to do this series for a while and I couldn't find it in like all of my books that I have downloaded. <laughs> and so I finally found it and so we're going to start the Tell Me series by Charlotte Bird. I've done other books by Charlotte Bird. I like her work. And book one is called Tell Me to Stop. We meet Olive and a couple of days ago she received a check for $167,699. She's talking with her friend Sydney about it and Sydney of course is concerned. There's no other information in the envelope and they have no idea where this check came from. So Sydney's whole thing is you don't know what you're getting yourself wrapped up into. The amount of the check happens to be the actual amount down to the cent of what she owes to Wesley College. This is in, uh, they're in Boston. So Sydney is Olive's roommate. Uh, they've been friends since uh, the, uh, her like second year in school and they've been close ever since and um, now they're roommates uh olive of course is scared she's terrified she doesn't know what could happen as well if she deposits this check um so she's thinking of all the negatives and then kitten and then sydney kind of blurts out but what if the check is real Olive and Sydney, they're still kind of going back and forth. We find out that Olive is a content specialist at a company right now. She went to school. Her degree is in uh, mathematics, but this was the best she could find right now. Um, Job-wise, it pays around $53,000, $54,000 a year. Um, her friend comes from a Chinese-American family. They're wealthy, um, so she didn't have to worry about, you know, tuition, taking out loans, room and board her parents took care of that because it was like 50 grand I think um for the tuition um so you know she doesn't have any debt <laughs> so Olive has some theories she's wondering like if someone like set her up at the job like if this is one of those YouTube videos and it's a joke and then she even looks at Sydney Sydney and is like did you do this and she's like no I wouldn't do anything like this so they're going back and forth Eventually, Olive says, you know what? I'm just going to do it. She opens up her banking app to do it, but it only allows uh, a $2,500 deposit. So she's like, I guess I'm going to the bank tomorrow. Next day, Olive goes to work. She gets a break. Or really what it is, is her supervisor goes to get coffee. So she takes that time to go to the bank. <laughs> so she's nervous. She's shaking. She gets up to the teller. She's, you know, really nervous, gives the check. She's got all these different scenarios running through her mind of what could happen. She's thinking that, you know, um, they're just going to arrest her right now in the bank. She has like all these whack thoughts. That was funny to read. Um, the woman says, you know, let me go get my manager. And she's thinking, yep, this is it. They've called the police. The manager comes He's like, did you need to make a withdrawal today? And she says, no. And he says, okay, well, it'll take a few days for it to clear. Um, but if there's anything else, you just let us know. And then she leaves out. So she calls Sydney, tells her what happened. And Sydney wanted to meet up for lunch, but she was like, nah, she's not doing all that. So when she gets home, Sydney's like, don't be mad. She had a bottle of Pinot Grigio. And she's like, you remember a few months ago when you needed me to log into your bank account? She's like, well, I just used it to check and you are $167,699 richer. Now, here's my thing about this. First of all, I can't think of a reason of why you would really need someone to log into your account. Um, that doesn't, I'm like, why would you ever need that? Um, I guess maybe she felt comfortable because her friend has money, so she really doesn't need hers. But at the same time, what if your friend's a secret klepto and she likes to steal? I don't know. So I just thought that was just weird. I was not okay with Sydney logging into the account because you're fucking nosy and you want to know what the hell is going on. 
and you make a decision like that. I don't think that was cool. Um, you could have very easily waited for that girl to come home and have her log in. You could have pestered her until she did it, right? You would have been annoying, but it's like, okay. But I just was not okay with her taking that liberty of, okay, well, you gave it to me for a specific reason. And now because I want to know something, I'm going to log in to, you know, what's the word? Um, to quench my thirst, you know, her curiosity of thirst. So I don't know. I'm not liking Sydney that much right now. <laughs> she just, I'm like, I don't really like you. <laughs> Olive's first thought is, you know what? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to pay off my student loans. And then Sydney's kind of like, well, you could wait a week or two or maybe do something else with the money. So this starts her to thinking like, oh, my gosh, you know, I've never, you know, I haven't gone on vacation in, a, you know, a few years. Um, a few months ago, she had got invited to go to the Bahamas with Sydney and her friends. They're all, you know, they come from rich families, but she couldn't afford to go on the trip um, even though Sydney was like, you know, I'll pay for you, but she was too proud to accept that. She was just too ashamed to accept that type of generosity from her. And those were the literal words that she used, that she felt ashamed. So, I mean, I would feel weird too. I don't know. It'd be kind of hard for me as well. I'm not going to knock her for that because in the back of my mind, I would kind of feel like at some point I'm going to feel obligated when you ask me to do something because you've done this generous thing for me, you know, and I, and I myself want to do things because I want to do them. I don't want to do them because I feel like I'm forced. So I, I understand it to an extent. I don't fully think that's where she's coming from. I just think there's this, you know, my friend has money. I don't. And I was going to be about a, around a bunch of rich women and I was just going to feel less than, I think that's more so of her issue. Based on so far with what I've read. Sydney then says, you know, well, maybe you should start a business. She's like, I know you want to go and get your master's in mathematics, but you're never going to make any real money doing that. You know, Sydney herself works in a lab. She knows with what she's doing. She's not going to be able to make that a ton of money or real money, which she considers making 57, you know, like a hundred thousand a month, you know, um, but she, of course, Olive's like, I don't even know how to run a business, you know. I don't even know where to start with that. And so then Sydney's like, exactly, you know. And so Olive says, well, what would you do? So Sydney tells her, well, pretty much she would start a lifestyle brand. She has this plan pretty much all set up. She wants to create a line of clothing for women of all sizes. Um, she has this... Uh, amount uh that she knows she needs about 30 grand to get everything started um she all she pretty much would have to do is scale back on the um stuff that she buys because she gets a monthly allowance um so if she scaled back she could have that money in no time and so she's got a dream clearly she's really mapping something out and so she basically is like you know you you want to find something that you'll be happy doing every day. She's like, I know I'm not going to be happy every day, you know, in a lab, you know. <laughs> but Sydney doesn't have any idea of what she would want to do. And so she says, you know what? I'm just going to pay these loans off. So she goes in and she starts paying them off. Um, before she paid her last one, she's thinking like, you know, her mom has, re she had back surgery probably like over a year ago. She's got a lot of medical bills and stuff like that. And she's thinking, you know, maybe I could help my mom out. But then it's like the bills are just going to keep coming. Like, no, nah, let me go ahead and let me take care of this. So she pays off everything. And that night when she's in her room alone, she cries. But they were tears of joy because it was like she felt free. She was finally from underneath that burden of debt. A couple of days have passed and Olive is helping out her mother. I can't remember what her mother's name is. Um, her mother's had a spasm, so she's been in a lot of pain. So she's been staying with her the past couple of days. And we find out her mother is absolutely awful. Maybe that's why I didn't even want to remember her name. She is just absolutely, I don't even, I don't even know if I can call her human. 
Like, she's that despicable to Olive. And now I completely understand why Olive was like, you know what? Let me just pay off my stuff. Her mother says, um, you know, basically everything's her fault. She got knocked up with her when she was 18. They're Catholic. Their parents forced them to get married. Um, the father was a drunk, and then it forced her to put on weight. It's all their fault. The only person that was perfect was Patrick, um, who I think was probably like the middle or youngest kid. Um, she also has a brother named Owen who is in the state pen for armed robbery. Uh, we find out that Patrick is dead. He apparently got killed in a car accident. The mother blames the father because the father bought him the car and Patrick was perfect. Um, clearly he wasn't because he had this high alcohol level and he, and it crashed into a tree head on. I'm kind of wondering did he, you know, he might have meant to do it. You know, you never know, you know. Because this woman is awful. Um, but she just says stuff to her like, you know, if Patrick was still alive, he would have given me grandbabies. He would have married a nice Catholic girl. But you and your brother, you won't even have children for me. I mean, she's just awful and crazy. Absolutely crazy. Um, she calls her all kind of awful things calls her fat just she's disgusting to her um she raised the ipad like she was getting ready to hit olive and olive kind of like you know coward so clearly she's used to this type of treatment from her mom and clearly it's gotten physical and i'm just like oh my gosh but blaming those children that why you fat bitch you stuck you the one stuffed your face with food how the fuck you gonna like blame the kids for that like she's just awful and i really feel really bad for olive reading this like it's like gosh you came from that <laughs> good grief we find out that olive another letter and she's about to read it again so she's reading the letter her mother barges in yells at her what are you doing she drops the letter picks it up and as she's trying to walk past her mother her mother snatches the letter reads it out loud and so now the mother wants to know what the letter's talking about accepting gifts he's like what gift did you accept and so she winds up saying that um it was like an elephant or something like that. Cause she knew if she told her mother it was money and she didn't give her mother money, her mother was going to lose it. So she said it was this elephant she saw in a thrift shop and someone bought it for her. Her mother kind of bought it. Well, in the letter though, it says that, you know, all expenses would be paid, uh, you know, for her to go to Maui, you know, and that it's from someone named NC. So, her mother just starts talking to her even worse. She's like, you're stupid. Like, no one's going to take you seriously. You know, whoever this is, they they don't, you know, they're, all they're going to do is just sleep with you. They're not going to give you anything. Like, she just just rips the girl to shreds constantly. Um, we find out that her mom has, like, always just pretty much been awful to her. Like, when she got accepted to school... Um, she told her she was stupid for trying to better herself. She says, you're trying to go to school so you can be better than me. She tells her she's fat and ugly. No one's ever going to marry you. I mean, maybe someone would marry you, but it's not going to be some Hollywood person with money. Um, and then she reads the letter. She takes the letter. The mother burns it with a lighter. We find out this isn't the first time the mother has burnt important shit. She burnt her high school diploma. She burnt her passport. Um, so basically, whenever she tries to do better for herself, the mother tries to stop her. So she's just, she's just, she's, I don't even like to call her a human. I'm like, oh my gosh, but there are people, there are individuals like this in the world. It's so sad. So she's not staying the night with her mother, you know, and her mother's like, you're not going to stay tonight. And I'm sitting there going, what you, after what you just said and did to her, like the fuck? So she tells her mother, your laundry's done. The meds are by your bed. Your food will be here soon. Um, 
and so when she gets outside she sends the email accepting the offer to meet uh this nc person and she also decides she's never going to see her mother again and i do not blame her at all Olive's back home with Sydney, and Olive is packing her stuff because girl is going. Once she sent that confirmation, that email saying she was coming, all she was sent the uh, travel details. She's taking off a week from work. Girl is going. So then Sydney's like, I don't know. I don't know if this is safe. You know, you don't know enough about this person. You know, um, and Olive's like, I want answers, and this is my way of getting them. And so that's just it. So Sydney knows how horrible her mother is. And she's like, what did your mother do? Like, did like how bad was it this time? And like, is that what's pushing you to do something so drastic? And she's like, no, I want to know exactly who this is, why they did this for me. I just need answers at this point. That's it. Um, we do learn that she feels like, you know, a lot of people when they deal with toxic types of relationships, um, family member or not, um, I think she feels like, you know, they always want that. The mother's love is supposed to be the easiest one you get, right, from your mother, from your father. And so because she doesn't get it, she tries to work to get it, not realizing there's nothing you're going to be able to do that this person will ever really love you or ever treat you worth a crap. Like, it's never going to happen. We find out the mother really doesn't have any friends. Um, she was so awful to him, you know, so nasty. So these past couple of years, she's been very isolated. Um, so the car's coming for her. It's going to take her to the airport. There's going to be a stopover in Los Angeles. It's a first class ticket. And she is on her way. So she gets on the plane and then someone comes and sit next to her and she says, what are you doing here? Sydney's ass has bought a ticket and has booked a seat right next to her. We find out the same day she got her traveling details, she booked a ticket as well. She was like, I'm not letting you go by yourself, you know. I'm not, I don't know, I'm a little, I'm not too mad at her for this. Um, was it because you wanted, you were worried about her or is it you wanted some adventure for yourself? I don't know. I just kind of wonder. Or maybe it could be both, right? Two things can be true at once. All of is thankful because she was very nervous. Um, So she's cool with it. So, okay. But that just kind of was lingering in the back of my mind about Sydney. Again, remember, I'm not too crazy, crazy about Sydney right now. <laughs> So they get there, of course, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's beautiful. It takes them about two hours to get to this uh, home or shall we say estate. And um, when they get there, their driver's name was Thomas. And uh, he wanted to, he was like, you know, he would take them on a tour of the grounds and stuff like that later. Uh, they're getting a place ready for Miss Catalano. I think that's her last name, uh, Sydney's. But that kind of made Olive feel bad. Like, oh my gosh, I brought someone here. But technically, I'm like, but you didn't bring her. Like, your friend decided to do this. She invited yourself. It really wasn't shit you could do about that. You know what I mean? Like, ain't no point in feeling bad. We do find out a name. Uh, the person that had brought her there uh, was a woman named Amelia Duell. And um, we know that the man's name is Crawford. Um, Amelia, of course, did all the travel plans. Uh, Mr. Crawford is supposed to meet her and her friend in about three hours at a cocktail hour. And um, she, you know, Amelia says, you know, he wants both of you all to attend. You all can take a dip in the pool, you know, do whatever until about six. So Sydney wants to go take a nap. And um, she, of course, asked her, do you know someone with the last name Crawford, you know? And she's like, I've never met anyone with that last name. So Sydney's like, well, I'm going to go lay down. She's tired. And Olive's too wired to do so. So she goes for a walk. She winds up going towards the water. Falls, of course. A guy comes up and, you know, asks her if she's okay. She's like, I'm good. I just got a couple scratches. I'm fine. 
he tells her, you know, next time use the real path trail. And she says, oh, okay. And, you know, she, he, the person goes back out into the water. And I'm like, I guarantee you that is Mr. Crawford. <laughs> they go to this cocktail hour. They're mingling with people. Uh, there was a group of 30-year-old women she was having a really good conversation with. But Sydney is one of those people. She knows how to work a room. So she just kept moving, you know, going and walking and talking with different people. So they've met, like, half the people in the room at this point. Uh, she sees Amelia goes up to her and it's like you know is mr crawford coming and she says he's running really late he's stuck in a business meeting he'll meet up with you later and she's like can i ask you something who is mr crawford amelia doesn't say anything she won't tell her much um we do know amelia is the one that took you know was the one that sent the check like she's taking care of everything but she has no idea as to why he's doing this for her um, and she doesn't want to give too much information of what she does know. And she's like, please don't ask anyone here at the party. You know, these are his business associates. He likes to keep his private life private. I just can't tell you anymore. You know, he wants to be the one to tell you everything. So she asked her, you know, just please allow him to give you that. So then Sydney runs up and she's like, I got a date. So she's met this guy who's a pediatrician. Um, Olive is like, well, your parents are going to be happy. He's a doctor. But um, he also does, like, uh, work with a uh, clinic that's poor, you know, to help out. And, you know, her parents wouldn't really be about that. They're more so about status, money, that type of thing. Sit, not Sydney. Uh, Olive, of course, is like, you know, do you think this is a good idea, you know? And Sydney's kind of like, you know, this is no different than if I met a guy you know, out in Boston, you know, and I'm going to get to know him. It's no different, but it's still a, it's still the thing. Like you just gave her this whole spiel about it. And then it's like, now you want to be carefree. You know what I mean? Like, come on. So she walks with her back to her bungalow. The guy's name is James Dupree. Um, while Sydney's getting ready, she tells the guy, she's like straight up, you know, can I get your phone number and the name of where you're going? to take her for dinner and i'm like she doesn't want anything to happen to her friend the guy understood he was like you're actually a really good friend you know and he gives her all the information and so she asked him about mr crawford and he says yeah nicholas crawford you know we're, we're pretty good friends and that's all he pretty much says <laughs> he does say that he is one of the largest investors in the area especially with this new resort that's coming along and i guess there's some issues with permits and different things um, but that's pretty much all the information she gets out of James. Olive goes back to her bungalow. She's tired, but her mind, of course, is still wired. So she pulls out one of her ebooks. She's reading one of her favorite dirty scenes. She's getting hot and bothered. She starts to masturbate. And there's a knock on the door. She doesn't say anything at first because she's like, maybe I'm tripping. But then there's another knock. So she's like, you know, who is it? So she scrambles to get her bottoms on to get to the door and Amelia's like Mr. Crawford wants to see you now and she's like right now she's like yeah she's like he just got back from his meeting and Olive goes absolutely not she's like I don't work for him you know and she says he invited me here I showed up he didn't so I'll see him in the morning and she shuts the door she gets back in her bed. She tries to read the same passage, but it's not doing it. So she finds another one and it gets her there. She's making herself calm and then there's a bamming on her door. So she gets up and she's like, Amelia, I told you I'm not going to see him tonight. But of course, when she opens the door, there is no Amelia, but it is our Nicholas Crawford. And it was just what I thought. It was a surfer guy from earlier. And she, of course, was like, you know, why didn't you just say who you were before? <laughs> and he was like, I wanted to meet you at the party, but then I got called away on business. And she, uh, he says, you know, would you meet up with me tomorrow evening around 7? There's something I want to discuss with you. So the next morning, she goes to see Sydney, tells her about Nick. She wants to tell her about Nicholas, but she also wants to know what happened with James. And so we get a little backdrop about Sydney. Sydney is not like 
a size two. She's got like ass hips. And probably the past, I want to say year or so, she's gotten really comfortable with her body. And we find out that she had dated this guy um, through college and like a year into them living together. And their parents were friends with each other and they were making wedding plans. And then the guy tells her he's gay. And he's like, you know, we can still get married. You know, we'll just have our lovers and we'll just be discreet. And she was like, it is 2019, not 18, whatever. And I'm not doing this, you know. And she is happy with herself now. And it's really beautiful to Olive for her to see this side of her friend. And she asked how the date went and everything. And she was like, I mean, he was he's great in bed. And then the James guy walks out and she's like, you weren't even going to tell me he was here. And she's like, nope, I want to see you jump. So her and James are really sweet together. And she's just really happy for her friend. She did want to tell her, talk to her about the Nicholas, but she's just reveling uh, in the fact of seeing her happy friend right now. I'm sorry, seeing her friend happy right now. Her and Cindy spend the day basically going on an adventure. You know, they rent a car. Or they get a car, shall we say, because Thomas gets it for him. He wanted to take them, but they were like, no, we want to do this ourselves. So they wind up hiking, and they wind up at a waterfall. They take some really great pictures. Um, Sydney is like, you know, I wonder what he wants to talk about. And I'm like, uh, probably the reason why he gave you the fucking money. I'm like, shit, that's, that's the million-dollar question. So she goes and meets him later on that evening in the gazebo. Um, and he, of course, is like, you know, thank you for meeting me. And she says, thank you for the gift. That was really generous. And he says, you're welcome. And he says, you know, for me, it wasn't that much. <laughs> and then he says, you know, now we can discuss how you can repay that debt. Olive is like, but you said that was a gift. A gift shouldn't have to be repaid. He's like, true. He's like, but you also didn't have to take it. I'm like, damn. <laughs> Um, so she asked, you know, like, did you hire like a PI or something? Like, how did you know about, you know, what I owed? He says, I just looked up your credit so score and saw all your debt. And I was like, well, damn. So then he says, um, do you want to hear what the offer is or do you want to keep arguing? And he says, the deal is she has to be with him for 365 days. Wherever he goes, she has to be there. She automatically says, I'm not sleeping with you. And he says, that's fine. But before it's over, before it's over, you'll be begging me to touch you. And when he said that, she felt the tingles. Um, she, you know, she's honest with herself. When she met him, she thought it was very attractive. Now, she says he looks like Tom Cruise and Mary, Jerry Maguire. And I mean, if you, that's what you like, great. So in my own thoughts, I was like, you know what? I'm going to make him look like the guy Theo James. If you don't know who that is, look him up. That's a good looking man. So we're going to picture that Nicholas Crawford looks like him. <laughs> so she's like, okay, how do you know me? And why did you choose me? He takes a really long time to answer. And then after a long pause, he says, if I tell you something, you have to promise you won't tell anybody, not even Sydney. And then she says, I promise. So he starts talking and he talks about someone named Ashley, who's his sister. And Ashley was best friends with Olive. And horrible things happen. And we find out that their home life was awful. It was a really bad situation. And Ashley wind up taking herself out. Okay. So what happened was she had gotten pregnant by her stepfather. The mother blamed her and sent her to Mississippi to live with cousins. So... Olive's like, that doesn't make sense because, you know, Ashley like women, you know, that's not, that can't be right, you know, because she confided in me one time and she told me and she was nervous to tell me because she thought I was going to stop being her friend, which I would never do. And he says, well, 
I didn't know any of this stuff, basically. Um, what happened was two days after she got to Mississippi, she took herself out. But before she did it, she emailed him and um, he tells her that his name before was Nikki Reed. And so she had sent her brother this email and said everything that had happened to her. And um, he didn't see it until the next day. He, you know, was he used to do drugs and he was in the streets and stuff like that. And so he didn't see it. And I don't think there's anything he could have done, but it doesn't mean it. It He feels like, wow, what if I had of actually, you know, read that email? Could I have saved her? But I'm like, if you was in Boston, she's in Mississippi. How are you going to get there to her in time? Especially if you ain't have no money. You know, how are you going to get there? You know? So, that was really sad to read. Um, one of the uncles or cousins, where they were, like, making comments about her body and stuff like that. And she hadn't even been there an hour. And so, she went and she, she hung herself. I was like, damn. Um, he, of course, he feels like he fails her. And I don't know if that's something that he can stop. We find out that the request that Ashley made to him in the letter was like that. She said, you know, it's too late to help me, but help my friend Olive. She's a really good person. And so after Ashley was gone, he got himself clean, built himself up. And throughout the years, he's been checking on Olive. Um, he says, you know, you have, you know, you pretty much been able to maintain yourself, you know. And, um, but then he went back to the whole thing of you owe me. Now she's mad. Cause she's like, again, it's a gift, but now you're telling me I owe you. He says, well, then you owe Ashley. I'm like, well, fuck, that's just cruel, you know? And part of her reason, you know, she's thinking of, she was thinking about doing it, going through with this 365 days. But, you know, as she, and she was thinking like, you know, this was maybe a way of her to kind of make amends because she felt like she hadn't been a good friend. Even though Ashley stopped coming to school, the girl reached out, you know, she tried to find where she lived because she was never allowed to go to the house. Um, she tried to find the girl, but she couldn't do it. But, you know, again, she feels like I could have done more. Um, so she feels like she failed Ashley as well. She's crying and all this type of stuff. And... Um, She, of course, is mad that he made that comment and she tells him, you know, fuck you. <laughs> she starts to walk off and um, he says, you know, if I gave what I gave to you, don't you think I will compensate you for your time? And he says, I will reward you handsomely. And then he says, one million dollars. Olive is in a frenzy. She gets back to her bungalow she actually winds up going to sydney's bungalow first she's like we're leaving now sydney's like what happened she won't talk she's like we got to get out of here she's like you know sydney's like what did he do did he hurt you like what's going on olive's not getting any answers she just starts um taking sydney stuff throwing it in bags she's like we've got to get out of here she ordered a, a ride share they get in the ride share um with their stuff sydney's still trying to get answers there's no reception now while they're on their way to the airport. Cindy's like, did you get flights out for us tonight? Girl ain't even looked at no damn flights. She's like, we'll figure it out when we get there. <laughs> She's like, we'll stay at the airport hotel if we have to. We just, we got to get out of here. And so Sydney again is like, what the hell happened? So she sends a text. She's not able to send it because of the reception. So she holds it up. And um, it says he wants me to stay here for 365 days. So then when they get to the airport, there's no flights out that night. Cindy wants more, wants more information. And um, Sydney's like, okay, did he threaten you? Like, is he trying to make you do it, you know? And Olive just keeps saying, we have to get out of here. We have to get out of here. <laughs> um. Sydney's like, but it doesn't sound like there's like an imminent threat, you know? <laughs> She's like, so I don't understand. And all of a like, it's just a feeling that I got, you know? And she tells the whole story, which she had promised not to tell, but she's told it now. And Sydney's like, okay, 
we're leaving because of a feeling because Sydney's been enjoying her time she doesn't want to go and this doesn't sound like a reason to be running so she says you know I'm not leaving tonight she's like I'm gonna stay and I'll leave when I'm scheduled to leave out in a week she's like you know we can stay at an Airbnb enjoy ourselves so this is my thing about with Sydney wanting to stay very much it is a selfish reason right she's met a great guy she's enjoying herself on the island she doesn't want to leave and I get that um what your friend just told you it does not sound like imminent danger um it doesn't sound like something's going on it sounds like your friend just fucking panicked okay and I get that But then I'm kind of like, but should she have still gone with her? I don't know. That's where I'm a little, I feel I, I kind of float uh, on both sides with that. You know, like, should you go with your friend even though they're, you know, probably not making the right decision and their decision could affect what you got going on in your life? I don't know. I feel like maybe you shouldn't allow that. I feel like she had a really great compromise. She's not like she told her she needed to go back, right? She wasn't saying that you need to go back and stay. We need to stay there. She's like, listen, we can get our own place and we can just enjoy ourselves here. Olive's point was, yeah, but I'm just going to be looking over my shoulder thinking he's going to come and get me. But he never said and he's never told you or given you that type of vibe that he's going to come after you he's saying this is the choice right he's saying listen this is the choice you can come stay with me for 365 days you ain't even got to fuck me right that's what he's saying now he does say you don't wind up begging me but that's more so because there's a physical attraction they both can feel it right but he's not forcing himself upon you like that so even though I'm not the biggest Sydney fan, I do kind of understand I'm not that mad with Sydney for saying, hey, why can't we just turn this into a girl's vacation and enjoy ourselves, you know? Her motive is also based upon the fact that she's met somebody, yeah, but she wants to enjoy being somewhere that she hasn't been. And... Unfortunately, Olive is just in full panic mode and she can't see anything else. It feels like I need to flee. I need to get out of here. Um, but she's also been a little sleep deprived. So I don't know if she's, you know, functioning on all <laughs> cylinders. <laughs> what is it firing on all cylinders? <laughs> she gets a flight back in coach. She's got some layovers. The ticket's $1,300. She puts it on a credit card, and when she gets back to Boston, she passes out. Um, she sleeps probably for a couple of days, and when she's finally, like, I can't stay in my bed anymore, she goes out for a walk. Um, she's been getting, like, tons of texts from her mom since she left, both apologizing and berating her, and then she sees a text where her mom says, I'm in trouble. Um... I owe money you know I need your help and that gets her attention and she winds up going over to her mother's now I'm just kind of like you trust your intuition on this shit but you had to run your ass over to this piece of shit of a not even human but boy you felt that imminent danger when it came to goddamn Nicholas Crawford I'm just saying just saying so on our way over to her mom's house, um, we get a little backdrop on her mom. So her mom uh, is an alcoholic pill popper. She's, you know, had to, you know, clean her up from her own vomit. She's passed out. She's went and got her mom prescription pills when she runs out. Runs out. Uh, she does all the illegal stuff, basically. She'll do it for her mother. And so... What her mother has done is this bitch has been online gambling and she bet 30 fucking grand. Apparently it was supposed to be a sure thing. She had put in $7,000 a week prior and made 20 
and she gets a letter from the site saying that they're shutting it down and um, there's an integrity issue and so she went to someone named Marlo who has some type of mob tie she like runs Charleston which is just part of Boston and um, she's like now she owes this money and I'm just sitting there like I would I just couldn't care like but unfortunately this is her mother and there's an obligation she feels there and damn it it's awful when there's obligation involved it's just awful because she feels bad that her mother's in the situation even though her mother put her fucking self in the situation her mother says that bullshit of, you know, I didn't want to ask you for it because you've helped me so much. But it's manipulation. It's to make her think that she's grateful for what she's done for it, that she's grateful for what you've done for her and that she wasn't trying to involve you in this, you know. So it's like she she is thankful for the good things, for all the things you've done for her. It's just class, a classic manipulator. Uh, she's a classic manipulator. And she knows what strings to pull because she knows this girl desires that affection and that love from her. And so she keeps dangling it in front of her like it exists and it never will. So it's just it's it's just so sad. So then her mother actually um, starts to tell the full truth, which, which is... She apparently borrowed 50 grand from Marlo. And I'm like, this fucking bitch just, ugh. We get a little backdrop and we find out uh, the night before Owen went to prison, um, he told her what really happened to their father. So apparently the father liked to bet on the ponies. And he lost major amounts of money. He started missing payments. He went out, was never seen again. So the mother put it on them, you know, and said, you know, he left me because of you people, you know. But what apparently really happened is Marlo had him taken out. So then the mother's like, you know, well, don't you have some credit you can borrow or something? And I'm just sitting here like this awful fucking person. <laughs> She's like, I don't have that kind of money. You know, I don't have that kind of credit. She's trying to think of a way. She's like, well, maybe you just need to leave. She's like, you can get a new identifi I, you know, identification. You know, you always wanted to go see, you know, uh, the Grand Canyon. Maybe go to Arizona, New Mexico. She's like, I'll help you. You know, I'll get you a fake ID. All this fucked up shit. And um, the mother says, you know, well, Marlo did want you to work for her at one point. Remember? So I'm like, this bitch wants you to prostitute yourself out just for her. I would have been like, they just going to have to come get you. I'm sorry. Like, instead of her doing what she can do to fix it, she don't want to do that. She doesn't want to leave Boston, right? She wants her daughter to do something to fix this for her. But see, that's what happens when you fix shit for no good fucking people. Even, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to just say no good people. They expect it, right? You bail me out so much. Now I expect you to do it. So when you don't do it, I'm going to really rage you on you because you normally get me out of these things. You normally put me above yourself. Why are you not doing that now? I'm reading this book and at, at this moment, I'm just kind of like, if this girl does this, I am going to lose it. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, Nicholas, you didn't have to fuck Nicholas, you know, and that was a million dollars, but your mother expects you to lay on your fucking back. How many times you gonna have to do that to get some money to get what she owes? So I hope I'm just like reading this and I'm just going, she better not be even considering this shit. So now her mother's pissed that she's not willing to prostitute herself out. Her mother starts calling her an ungrateful bitch, how she raised her from 18 years and all this type of shit. And this is the least that she could do for her. Um, she says, you know, um, Sam's doing well. 
we get a little backdrop about who this Sam girl is. So she went to high school with Sam. Sam used to have nice stuff. She thought Sam had this really great boyfriend. Come to find out it was like her pimp. She worked for Mar Marlo. So their mom had got evicted. They didn't have a place to stay. Winter was coming. And Sam was like, you know, basically she could get her 300 in one night. And the motel where they were trying to stay in was like 250 a week. So she was going to go do it. She goes in the room. And as soon as the guy starts walking towards her, she runs out. Well, thankfully, the storm, the winter storm came and the city had to provide extra shelters and stuff. So she was able to go to a shelter and do her schoolwork and things like that. So she didn't follow through with it. But this is just so sad that her mother wants her to put herself in this situation, you know. Apparently, Sam's doing really well. She lives in Beacon Hill. She services senators, you know, people like that, high-powered folks. So um, she's making a really good living, and she wants her daughter to sell her pussy for her debt. But then again, what would you expect with someone who is this completely awful to you? You know what I mean? It is not even that shocking. So I'm thinking maybe that's why she felt prickly or whatever it was about the offer from him. Because even though he said, you don't have to fuck me, maybe it just took her back to when she was, however old, a teenager and was considering doing this shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, maybe that's what, that had to be what it was. Because what he said was not enough to make you run off the fucking property. I'm just saying. Before she leaves out, she tells her mother, I told you what I could do to help you. And that's it. I'm not doing anything else. And she leaves. She goes home. She's been getting text messages. Um, she's been staying in contact with Sydney. Uh, Sydney's, you know, taking different pics. She's gone snorkeling. All the stuff she wanted to do. But I'm like, you could have did it. Had you just fucking stayed. You know? Um, there, of course, are some pictures of her and James. And the last couple of show, last couple of pics show Nicholas in the background so she's all like you know why are you with him and she's like him and james are friends you know and she's like i think you over th you know basically you blew up for no reason you know and olive is thinking he's just trying to get close to you to try and get me to come back and i'm just like bitch your radar off you know i, I don't think you are very reliable right now yes good you didn't want to you didn't you know agree to go prostitute yourself for your mother you know great but still, your radar is all off because you should have felt bullshit with your mama when she sent that goddamn text message. I'm just saying. You, you, your spotty senses should have came alive. So, she hears a bamming on the door. She goes to open it. And uh, before she opens it, somebody says, uh, they're like, you know, there's some issues with the boiler. We need to check it. The guy bursts in and um, puts a revolver to her head. And it's like your mom owes money. And she's like, you know, that's not my problem. I don't owe any money. And the person's like, well, I'm making it your problem. So they've taken her mother. Uh, she's got five days to come up with 50 grand. Um, or he says you'll never find the body to bury. And I'm going to sound cold as fuck. But I would just been like, sayonara. Like, that is an evil, disgusting thing. That's what, that per that's what she is. Because I don't even like to call her a person. She's awful. So she's thinking like, you know, she can try and run up some credit and stuff like that, but that's still not going to be enough money to help. It's just not. The guy leaves his card. His name is Shepard Sudler. And um, he's like, you got five days, no extensions. He's like, I can meet anywhere in the tri-state area. I take cash only. So the little girl inside her, of course, is going to make her do it. So then she starts thinking about the fact that, you know, Sydney, her parents have money. Sydney's been saving up money. You know, maybe she can get, you know, maybe she can borrow it from Sydney. And this pisses me the fuck off. And this makes me really dislike Olive in this moment. Because your friend is saving up for something that she's dreaming about. Why should she sacrifice for your 
garbage of a fucking parent. Like, why would you even consider asking her to do that? You know what I mean? Like, that's insane to me. So I'm not going to take no trip, you know, because I'm embarrassed, basically, right? But I'm going to go to this extent for someone who feels nothing for me that I'm trying to get to love me. How f It's just sad. It still pisses me off with her like I do feel bad for her, but it also angers me that you're willing to do this to your friend, even ask your friend for this kind of money. It's a lot of fucking money, you know? So I'm like, that's just freaking awful. So uh, Sydney's basically been staying um, with James since like the second night she was there. And so then they're on video chat and Ovid, uh, not Ovid, I can't talk. Olive blurts out everything that happened and asks to borrow the money. Sydney, of course, is like, that's a lot of money. I'm not able to get a loan from my parents for anything like that. You know, I can only give you like an advance on my credit cards and what I've saved up for my business. And that's still only like half with what um, Olive can come up with with advancing on her credit cards. And um, so then Sydney's like, basically, you know what you need to do if you want this money fast. Like, you need to call Nicholas. That's, that's the option right now. You know? That's it. There is no other option. You need fast money, you're going to have to reach out to him. And... I don't feel bad for her because first of all, you ran away like a coward. You didn't have to do it like that. Um, so now you're going to have to have, you know, come back basically and kind of almost beg him to do something for you, which this one even got to you. If you had to stage your ass in fucking Maui, <laughs> you wouldn't have dealt with this bullshit from your mother. You know what I'm saying? Like, ugh. Or maybe she would have, because that mother is just so goddamn awful. So she eventually calls Nicholas. He, of course, answers on the third ring. Uh, she says, you know, this is Olive Kearns. They have all this silence, and he's like, don't hang up, Olive. And then she asks him, do you know what happened with her mom? He says, no. He's like, what happened? And his voice, there is, it's full of concern. And so she tells him what happened, and he says, what's your account number? She says, what? He's like, what's your account number? He's like, look it up. She looks it up. Gives it to him. He wires her 50 grand just like that. She's like, but your offer, he says, this has nothing to do with my offer. You need help? I can do it. Anyone in my position would do it. And she's like, not necessarily. So <laughs> he still, of course, wants her to go. He wants her to take the offer. But he's also, you know, separating. This has nothing to do with this. And um, he says, but I would like to, you know, take you to dinner tomorrow night. There's a really nice restaurant in Maui. Uh, would you do that for me? She's got the money. She's worried that what if she's about to give this money to the wrong person? What if they don't even work for Marlo? So um, she finds a way to get in contact with Sam. Uh, and uh, they meet up at a coffee shop, and they wind up talking in the bathroom. Sam searches her to make sure she does, she's not wired. <laughs> the girl told her, you can't trust anybody, um, but she apparently did make a call for someone because uh, she knows how to get in contact with Marlo, and um, it's all a very fucked-up situation. Uh, she clearly wants to save her mom. She's trying to think of good memories. Um, but I'm like, that shit just, it's not enough. So Sam told her, you know, someone will reach out to you. So she goes home that evening. There's a knock on her door. It's Marlo. She does confirm that her mother owes 50 grand. She's like, but I don't know a shepherd settler. She's like, I don't involve people's families in their debts. She's like, your mother's been a great customer to me for years like she wasn't due for another week and if she had asked for an extension i would have given it to her because she's always been such a loyal customer so i'm like so this wasn't her first time borrowing money this is a habit right 
And so then Marlo's like, do you have a balcony or a rooftop or something? So they wind up going out. I think it was on the rooftop. And um, she says that, you know, the person told her, you know, that if she didn't pay, they were going to take her out. And Marlo says the other option, she's like, yeah, someone could be impersonating me. Someone could be crazy enough or dumb enough to do that. She says, or your mother's playing you and she's hired somebody to kidnap her. So that way you would pay her debt completely. And she feels all the fucking blood drain out of her face. Marlo told her if I was you, I would take that money. Because I'm sure it's what you make in a year. She's like, you got a nice apartment here. You got a good job. She's like, I won't get involved in your mother stuff. She tries to explain that whole, but she's my mother. And Marlo's like, yeah, and I had a mother like that too. And people like that don't change. And you've got to put your foot down to stop that behavior. She's like, but if I give you the 50 grand, will it wipe my mom's slate clean? And she said, yeah, so she gives her the damn money. And to her, she feels like she can finally be free of her mother. I don't have that much confidence in her, okay? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I'm like, you will find a way to allow yourself to get pulled back in. I'm sorry. I just don't have any confidence when it comes to her being able to say no to her mother. I just don't. She's packing her stuff. She's going back to Hawaii. And when she's uh, on, her way out, well, on her way out to the ride chair um, to like a lift or whatever, someone grabs her arm. It's the Shepherd Sudley guy. She, of course, knows it was fake based on his expression when she says, I paid Marlo. But she tells him, you know, I don't know what you're doing, but, you know, you might want to get yourself out of this. He's like, you would really do that to your own mother? And she goes in about what happened. And he starts to crack automatically. He's no gangster. He's a bus driver. He lost his job. And he was trying to make some money because he was about to get evicted. And her mother had told him that she gave him $2,000 on the back end. And that's why he did this. So, yeah, the mom is a whole piece of fucking shit. I just, oh, she just irks me. Just like Marlo, Marlo had told her, you know. People like that don't change. They are who they are. Uh, so she tells him, I advise you get rid of that gun and you better take notice because people that mess with Marlo, you know, they go missing basically. And she doesn't have proof of this, but at the same time, she's letting him know you, you might want to try and get some, something hide or something and um he said she tells him and by the way tell my mother i said she can go i paid her debt and she can go fuck herself and again i hope she means it you know that she's really gonna stop dealing with the mother so a person comes to pick her up from the airport she thought it was going to be sydney but it was nicholas he asked sydney for a favor and of course she was going to agree to it um she doesn't feel anxious like she did before uh, when they go to the resort, the person calls her Mr. and Mrs. Landon. And she's like, so Landon is the last name, you know? And he's like, you know, I have many aliases and stuff like that. And he tells her, you know, they're going to play a game. They went to a resort. And I don't think I said that. <laughs> and that's kind of important. That's the reason he's giving these names. Um... So then they get ready for dinner in front of each other. It's like this teasing thing going on. Um, she's thinking she can get him to break, you know, because she's determined she's not going to break first. Um, now, this part of the book was actually placed right after she decided she was leaving Maui. And there was this chapter that was placed there that was letting you know that clearly she had gone back to Maui at some point I didn't think it fit I mean I get the whole thing of trying to foreshadow whatever it is but it just didn't fit to me it flowed better to just read it as it happened in my opinion so that's why I didn't put this part into the end anyway because it's like it didn't make sense to put it there to me for someone else it could have worked for the author clearly they liked it 
for me, it was just kind of like, this was better off just kind of going through it and seeing like, this is where we end up, you know? So anyway, I digress. Um, they wind up kissing this really passionate kiss. She's thinking like, oh yeah, I am about to get him to break, but he stops. She of course is like, why did you stop? He said, I told you, you were going to beg me for it. And so he, they wind up playing, I guess this is the game where he ties her up and he's telling her, she, he keeps saying to her, tell me to stop. She doesn't tell him to stop. Um, but she's also not begging him. She knows he wants it and vice versa, but like nobody's trying to cave in. <laughs> so he keeps saying to her, tell me to stop. And she's not saying it. Um, so he unties her. And she's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I told you, you were going to beg. So since she wasn't begging, he untied her. <laughs> she reaches for his tie and he whispers, no. Um, her hands drop to her sides and um, she asks, you know, what's wrong? She's trying to hide her disappointment. She's, it's not working. So with a wink, Nicholas says, we have a job to do. And that's how book one ends. <laughs> so the next book in the series is called Tell Me to Go. And we're going to dive into that one next week. What did you guys think of this? I really liked it. Now, when I first saw that there was a check involved, I immediately thought about Alpha. That series is when I did, um, like the first year I started the channel. Go back and listen to that. That was a, a great series as well. But this is different, and I like that, you know. But at first, I'm not going to lie, I was like, is this like Alpha? But no, it's different. But it's really good. Um, I liked it. Like I said, really my only complaint was just kind of with the how the author – tried to place that end piece in the middle it wasn't the full ending but it was like a good chunk of it and i was just like i ain't, i didn't like how that flowed that was the only thing for me that was kind of like i don't like it um i was very disturbed by that mother as you could hear in my rant she just got on my nerves i mean i'm just so thankful i don't have a mother like that you know like oh my gosh because this is just so awful and traumatizing um but I want to know what you guys think. Drop down in the comments and let me know how did you feel about book one. Uh, if you are in the market for a journal or notebook, I have some beautiful ones. That link is going to be available down below in the description section. Um, there's also tons of other videos for you to listen to until next week. <laughs> So drop down and listen to those, uh, share the channel. I really do appreciate you all. I appreciate your support. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to the Always Reading Book Club.